Enough of that stuff. You ready? If you got your Bibles, Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, and then we're going to jump into 2 Samuel chapter 13. So here's the deal. We've been trying to get ready to the story of Absalom, but you got to go through a whole lot of information about David. Uh, and then there's a really awful, ugly story in 2 Samuel 13 that we have to get through that is very, very important. This is the story of Amnon and Tamar, okay? The reason this story is so important, okay, is because it's an unthinkable sin that takes place between Amnon, who could potentially be the crown prince, uh, in the, uh, day, one of David's sons could have been the crown prince in Israel, and Tamar is his sister, and so his, uh, his half-sister. And so it's an awful situation that comes about. Uh, it's a wicked sin that takes place, but the lead-in of David and Bathsheba paves the way for Amnon and Tamar, and that then creates Absalom into being who he is. I did not put this in your notes, but if you want to write this down, uh, John Strapazon, uh, some of you got to meet him at the discipleship conference last week. Strap used to say this, what you do in moderation, your disciples will do in excess. Let me say that again. What you do in moderation, your disciples will do in excess. That goes uh, doubly for your family situation. If your kiddos are watching you navigate and tolerate and, and be part of certain sins, the level that you do it, they typically will take it and run it to a whole new level. You just have to be mindful of that. And the story of Amnon and Tamar are a picture. What unfolded with David and Bathsheba comes full grown uh, in the story of Amnon and Tamar. So that's the heavy part. You ready? Let's jump in and kind of do the lead in with a little bit lighter question. Have you ever had somebody sneak up on you to scare you before? All right. You ever had somebody sneak up on you to scare you before? Um, uh, just for the record, some are better than others at that. Some of you are not sneaky at all. You try really hard, uh, but you're not very sneaky. And then some of you are surgical with your sneakiness, right? You just, uh, you just are able to do it so well. So back in the day, uh, about to have my bachelor party, and uh, my, uh, Autumn and I got married very young, and so my best man was my brother, but my brother was a sophomore in college at that point, and so he had just watched a movie that I do not condone you watching, all right? He watched a movie called Old School, all right, uh, with Will Ferrell. Again, do not, I'm not telling you to watch it. I'm just telling you he, this is where he got the idea, uh, but uh, he decided that just like in the movie Old School, he wanted to have uh, my friends kidnap me and then take me to the bachelor party. And so uh, they do that in the movie. They pull up like at a supermarket and throw the guys in the, in the van. Well, anyway, uh, my brother calls my sister's boyfriend at the time, a guy named Jacob. Jacob was like six foot five, too, really, really tall. But he was a senior in high school, okay? And so he's the one who's tasked with kidnapping me. And so I'll never forget me and my buddy Cleo. Cleo, played, uh, Cleo and I played football together. Uh, I'm conference champion tailback at Hardin Simmons University. Cleo is a buff dude, all right? And then I was playing lacrosse at the time. And so I'm in like physical shape, peak physical shape of my life. And so all of a sudden we come up upon this high school kid who's in a ski mask there in the parking lot of Walmart in Abilene, Texas, all right? And so we walk up. There he is. It's clearly Jacob, you know? I mean, you can't, can't deny it. <laughs> clearly Jacob. His shoulders are slumped over. And uh, we walked up, and Cleo and I are like, what are you doing, dude? And then all of a sudden, he goes, hey, man, your brother told me to kidnap you. He goes, but our family, the, my dad, this is what he did. We collected knives. And so he goes, I know that you guys played football and collected knives, and I don't want to do it. And we're like, it's okay. It's all right. <laughs> You're going to be okay? And so we were, telling, we were like, we'll just get in the van. How about that? How about we should get in the van? You know? And so anyway, tried to sneak up on us. Didn't work very well. It's a great bachelor party. Anyway, all that to say, some of you know Denver up here leading worship. Denver is a sneaky one, all right? He loves, I mean, shocker, right? Shocker that Denver would be a sneaky one, okay? Denver, we asked his wife one time. We just said, hey, you know, does Denver ever pull pranks on you? And her response was priceless. Heather looked back and she goes, sharing a room with that man, you sleep with one eye open. That's what she said. And so I thought that was a great word. Some of you know Denver just fits perfectly, right? So here's the deal. Sometimes when things sneak up on us, they do it well. And then other times, not so well. I want to read you a passage of scripture. Genesis chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 6 and 7. Uh, this is right before something incredibly unthinkable would take place. The first recorded murder takes place here between Cain and his brother Abel. Cain knows the Lord in this circumstance, but he's not obeying God's law. He's not offering his first fruits, his, his best portions uh, to God. And yet, uh, uh, and yet we have a situation where his brother Abel is, and it makes Cain so angry. Well, listen to this. There's something sneaky happening here. Verse 6, it says, The Lord said to Cain, 
Why are you so angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Look at this. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. Underline sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. In this passage, we find out that for each one of us, sin is hiding and laying in wait for us, and it desires to have us. How does sin start? Sin starts because there's something we know we should do that we don't want to do. Cain knows that there's no peace in his life. Even though he's offering sacrifices to God, it's not the way that God's asking for it. It's not his best, his first fruits, his first portion. So what happens? He just gets angrier and angrier, and then it turns from anger at himself to anger at those that God is blessing. He gets so angry at Abel. He gets so angry at his brother. So the Lord speaks to him and says, don't do this thing. Sin is sneaking up on you, and it wants a hold of your life. If you're taking notes, write this down. The Holy Spirit is our alarm when sin creeps near our lives. Let me say that again. The Holy Spirit is our alarm when sin creeps near our lives. The story of Cain is extra interesting to me because in a church service on a Sunday morning, there are several of you in here who have not made a decision to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Quite a few of you have. It's the reason that you're here. It's the reason you come faithfully. If that's you, you need to know this. Cain knew God. Isn't that interesting? Cain knew God. And not only that, in the passage that we're going to study about Amnon today, Amnon grew up in the household with David, the man after God's own heart. Amnon, the sin that he falls into, he knew what was right, and sin was still crouching at his door as well. The Holy Spirit screams to us a warning sign. And for some of you today... The whole reason that you walk through the door is because there is a flashing red light of warning for you from this passage of Scripture for someone who knows the truth to not let sin take hold of them. If you're taking notes, our million-dollar question, you ready? How does a Christian end up crossing a clear biblical boundary? How does a Christian end up crossing a clear biblical boundary? Now flip over to 2 Samuel chapter 13, and we're going to start in verse 1. For those of you with young kiddos, I want to encourage you next week. We're going to do this uh, story in two parts. This week, fairly tame. Next week, I want to encourage you to put your kiddos in child care and come to the service by yourselves. Um, it is a heavy, heavy subject matter that we're going to tackle next week. Okay, Don't avoid it. It's in Scripture. It's very important. And remember, the way we preach here, we go through the passage verse by verse, and we don't skip anything. This is in Scripture and a foundational story for David's household. If you've ever done a study on David, this moment that we're about to read through is a pivotal moment that must be discussed for him. But next week, uh, you guys, again, plan on coming by yourselves next week. You ready? Uh, Let's look. Addressing the question, how does a Christian end up crossing a clear biblical boundary? 2 Samuel 13, 1. In the course of time, Amnon, the son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon falls in love with his half-sister. Okay? This, by the way, the way this reads in 2 Samuel 13 would not have been okay Not just in God's law, but in just about any cultural norm during that time period. This would not have been okay. This is not something that would have been accepted. So look at verse 2. Amnon became frustrated to the point of illness. Circle, underline, and highlight that. He became frustrated to the point of illness on account of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. It seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Again, you read this, and you can almost feel sick to your stomach as you go through it, uh, just reading it as an outsider. But for Amnon, Amnon has become so obsessed with doing this wickedness that it's all he can think about. It's all he can process. If you're taking notes, how does a Christian end up crossing a clear biblical boundary? Number one, we become obsessed and infatuated with wickedness. We become obsessed and infatuated with wickedness. It is something that we saturate our minds with over and over again. Um, just for the record, obsession and infatuation are not foreign to me. If you notice, I'm wearing my shirt from a Texas Tech Red Raiders. I was asking a second ago, Mike, if you were a, a Notre Dame fan because Tech and Notre Dame play each other at 7 o'clock tonight, and I didn't know if I should punch you or not. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Mike, you want to fight Mike. He's Air Force. He'd, he'd take me down, all right? Anyway, all that to say, this time of year, 
My brain is saturated with college basketball. I love it so much. In fact, you just turn it on in the background. March Madness is so much fun. I'm not particularly a Baylor or a North Carolina fan, but that game yesterday, how many of you watched that game yesterday? Oh my gosh. They were down 25 with 10 minutes left, came back, took it to overtime. It was just unbelievable. Are you shaking? Are you a Baylor grad? That was mistake number one. Shouldn't have gone there. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. They won last year. We're going to let them buy, all right? Now listen. Now listen. Infatuation. Obsession. There's a point where it's just cheering for a team. It's just having some fun. There's a point when it becomes about your life. There was a movie back in the day that came out with Jimmy Fallon and Drew Barrymore called Fever Pitch. Did you ever see that movie back in the day? That's your, that's your neck of the woods, all right? Um, fever Pitch, about a Red Sox fan, but he's not just a Red Sox fan. Uh, Jimmy Fallon plays a rabid Red Sox fan. It's drifted into infatuation, and it's drifted into obsession to the point that he can have no positive relationships with anybody, uh, dating or otherwise, because his entire life uh, is about this obsession. You need to know, when we obsess and are infatuated with things other than God's holy word and our relationship with Jesus Christ, it comes to a point where what's in a person comes out of a person. What you have put into your mind makes its way down to your heart, and it begins to change the fabric of who you are. We don't look like Jesus. We don't look like someone living in accordance with his word. We start to look like the world around us. For some of you, the unthinkable, that you could drift into stealing something from your place of business, the place that you work. There's not a person in this room that wakes up and goes, you know what, I want to steal from my job today. And yet it happens. There's not a person in this room that would want to be unfaithful to their spouse. And yet it happens. There's not a person in this room that would want to tell off their boss in such a way that it would end up causing them difficulty or get them fired. There's not a person in this room that would truly desire to hate someone because of their race or their culture. And yet it happens all the time. There's not a person in this room who would want to physically hurt someone. And yet... We're in one of the highest crime spikes that we've had in this generation. Listen to me. How does it happen? Nobody wakes up in the morning and wants to be a jerk. How does it take place? Because we become infatuated and obsessed with sin, and it's crouching at our door, and it desires to take hold of us. With Amnon, Amnon obsesses so much over something that is taboo on every level that he is brought to illness just with the very thought of his sister. If you take a notes, a little quote here, unchecked obsession is fertilizer for the unthinkable. Unchecked obsession is fertilizer for the unthinkable. So what do you do if you're in that state of obsession and infatuation with wickedness? Romans chapter 12, verse 2 is the remedy. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Hit the reset button. And then you will be able to test and approve what the Lord's will is. His good, his pleasing, and perfect will. For some of you, you need to make the decision that when that obsession with sin comes up, that you stop and you hit the reset button. I'm a person who keeps a journal. And sometimes if I can start to see that infatuation and obsession are in my mind, I'm the type of person that likes to keep a list. And so what I'll do is I'll stop and go, Lord, I think this is starting to become a problem. Let me sit down and think about just how often this crosses my mind. And so I do the little tick marks, you know, every time something comes to mind. Can I tell you what's fun about that? Very rarely do I have to do that longer than one day. Because I'm like, I'll do this a couple of weeks and we'll see how often it comes to mind. Uh, by about three hours in, I'm like, I'm thinking about this all the time. Oh my goodness, this is starting to take hold of my mind, and then it could take hold of my heart. You hit the reset button by hitting your knees in prayer and crying out to God, Lord Jesus, purify my mind. Lord Jesus, cleanse my thoughts. Help me. Hit the reset button. That's a beautiful prayer to pray if you're struggling with obsession and infatuation with wickedness. Lord Jesus, cleanse my mind. Paul says it this way, save your spot in 2 Samuel, but flip over to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And we're going to look at verses 4 through 8. Paul writes it this way. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the God of peace, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Underline, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Stop right there. 
there for just a minute. Paul starts off in two-part message here. He starts off and says, the way that you guard your heart, placing it into Almighty God's hand, is through rejoicing and thanksgiving. Even when you start to feel like you've got a raw deal, or the days are difficult, or things aren't playing out the way that you want them to, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Present your request to God, what? With thanksgiving, believing that God is sovereign, believing that the universe is under his control. And when we cry out to him, we truly believe with all our hearts that he will answer us. He says, and then as he guards your heart, start to put good in. What's the antibiotic to a sinful mind? It's whatever is true. It's whatever is noble. It's whatever is right. It's what's admirable, what's praiseworthy and excellent. When we put the good in, the good ends up coming out. And we put the bad in, the bad ends up coming out. It begs the question, are you obsessing over something the Bible is clearly against? Are you obsessing over something that the Bible is clearly against? When we do that, we end up in a mess. Now flip over 2 Samuel again, and we'll look at verses 3 through 5. 2 Samuel 13, and now verse 3. It says, Now Amnon had a friend. Underline a friend, because he is not a friend. Amnon had a friend named Jonadab, the son of Shemiah, David's brother. Uh, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very shrewd man. Underline Jonadab is a very shrewd man. He asked Amnon, Why do you, the king's son, Looks so haggard morning after morning. Won't you tell me? Underline, won't you tell me? I love that little line there. Can I tell you what else is interesting? What was the name of Saul's son that was David's close confidant? Jonathan. You have Jonathan and Jonadab. Isn't that interesting? Jonathan is the one that helps protect David during one of his most complicated spiritual times. And you've got Jonadab here, who also is an outlier, that's a cousin to Amnon, that sees the sin that's stirring in Amnon's heart. You ever seen somebody who had a crush on somebody before? Is it hard to tell that someone has a crush on someone? Notice what Amnon's friend, Jonadab, does here. Jonadab looks at him and goes, I can see exactly what he's struggling with. I can see exactly what lust fills his heart. I mean, he's physically ill every time Tamar walks in the room because he can't, quote, do anything to her. How awful and sick is that? And yet it's oozing all over his body. It's who he is. It's the pheromone that he gives off when he walks into the room. So what happens? You've got this situation where Jonadab sees it and he exploits it. What's wrong with you, Amnon? What's wrong with his son? If some of us have watched The Crown on Netflix. I mean, you know, right? If they're not in the seat of power, they want to be as close as they possibly can. What he's done here is basically, if I can't be king, then I'm going to make sure you can't be king either. It says specifically he's a shrewd man. He's a plotter, a schemer. Look at what it says next. Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. After him confessing that, Jonadab could have looked at him as a Jonathan and said, dude, you know that can't be. You know that what you desire is wickedness. Let me come alongside you and pray for you so that you don't end up in this mess. But he's not met a confidant. He's met a conspirator. Look at what happens next. Verse 5. Go to bed and pretend to be ill, Jonadab said. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so that I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. Now stop there for a minute. Does that sound like a plan he came up with on the fly? He's watched him. He's plotted and schemed. And now all of a sudden he's become an encouraging accomplice alongside Amnon. If you're taking notes, you ready for this? How does a Christian end up crossing a clear biblical boundary? Number one, we become obsessed and infatuated with wickedness. And number two, we find an encouraging accomplice. We find an encouraging accomplice. In this story, Amnon is physically ill over this, but the courage to act and to truly put a plan to put it into action comes about when he meets someone who thinks the same way that he does. If you think about our country and some of the worst tragedies that have happened, wickedness happens with one bad individual. 
but it goes to an exponentially different level when that individual finds a friend, when they find someone who is like-minded in their hatred or in their wickedness. If you're taking notes, write this down. You ready? It has never been easier to find affirming accomplices, no matter how specific your area of interest, intentionally saturate your senses with Scripture. Say that again. It has never been easier to find accomplices, affirming accomplices, no matter how specific your area of interest, intentionally saturate your senses with Scripture. I'm going to give you a frivolous story on this one, but hopefully it sticks with you. So um, back in the day, I'm an August baby, and so I was always the youngest, and that meant through my entire uh, sophomore year of high school, I was bumming rides from other people, okay? And uh, living in Lubbock, Texas, where I grew up, uh, you drive everywhere, and so it was very difficult to walk anywhere because everything was so spread out, and so I'll never forget, um, I'm uh, 15 years old, and there was a girl at our school that was the it girl, okay? Now, just so you know, if you had somebody in your school that was the it person, and you were not the it person... You, like, desired to ask that person out or to be with them. But there was a hint of realism where you were like, yeah, I'm going to stay in my lane. You know what I mean? I realized they're going to be with somebody cool. You know what I mean? And uh, and I'm I'm just going to be me. All right? You know, I got to marry way over my head, uh, but it was after a whole bunch of maturity had to take place. All right? I'll tell you that just to say this. I knew my lane, but all you had to do was watch me to see that I had goo-goo eyes for this girl. And so I'm 15 years old. She's the it girl. And we got to serve together on the Fellowship of Christian Athletes board at the school. And I remember we're there together with one of our other friends who was the it guy for our class. And we're sitting together. He also was a full year older in our grade. And so he had the truck the longest, had this cool pickup truck. And so I remember after it's over, she had said something that kind of made the goo-goo eyes. I'll never forget. It's right around homecoming. And all of a sudden, infatuation, right? All of a sudden, I've got this obsession. And then my friend looks over at me. My friend, my John Adab, all right, looks over at me. And he goes, hey, you should ask her out. And I go, no, man. She would never say yes. She doesn't even like me. And he goes, I think she does. He goes, in fact, she's told me that she likes you. This was like more than 20 years ago, and it still makes me angry, all right? I go, you really think so? He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, she digs you, dude. She digs you, right? And I was like, what should I do? He goes, you know, homecoming's coming up. He goes you should ask her out. And I'm like, maybe I will. I'll start putting the plan together. He goes, I got my truck. I'll drive you over there right now. Let's drive over and you should ask her out. And so we get this pickup truck and I'm like, yeah, this is good. This is good. We make the drive over to her house, pull up in the front. I knock on the door. He stays in the truck. Knock on the door. She comes to the door and she goes, Zach, what are you doing here? You've never come by the house before. I go, yeah, I go, our friend dropped, uh, my friend dropped me off. And I go, I just have a question for you. And she goes, oh, of course. We go and we sit down. And here's what I watch. I start to say, you know, homecoming's coming up. I just would love it if you would consider going with me to dance. I'd like to ask you out. And I watch your face go. <laughs> and then she says, Zach, you're just so nice. You're just so nice. You're just so nice, right? And all of a sudden, my face drops, and I'm like, I hate my friend, right? I can't believe he would do that to me. And all of a sudden, it just, she lets me down so easy. I walk back to the truck. He is cracking up in his truck, (laughs) cracking up in his truck. Now, you want to make matters worse? Two days later, he asked her out, and she said, yes, coming. He was planning to take her anyway. (sighs) I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. (laughs) Four kids in a church plant, wonderful wife later. I'm doing just fine, all right? (laughs) Now listen, now don't miss this. Don't miss this. Jonathan or Jonadab. Jonathan's pushed you towards the Lord. Jonathan's helped you diffuse problems. Jonadab's, they want to watch you squirm like a worm on a hook. And here's the deal. How do you tell the difference between the two? The voice of the Holy Spirit. He tells you. Proverbs, by the way, save your spot here, but flip open to Proverbs chapter 26. If you are somebody who is struggling with your accomplices, with your friendships, great DC verse to memorize. And some of you staffers who are leading Bible studies, Proverbs 26, 24 through 26 is a great study to do a Bible study on with your coworkers. You ready for this? Here's what it says. 
A malicious man disguises himself with his lips, but in his heart he harbors deceit. Though his speech is charming, do not believe him, for seven abominations fill his heart. His malice may be concealed by deception, but his wickedness, look at this, will be exposed in the assembly. Circle, underline, and highlight in the assembly. In the assembly doesn't just mean public. In the assembly means on the record. That's the picture there. It says, for somebody that we hear from them what we want to hear, but we feel in our gut that they are a mess, that they are about themselves. I mean, to a deep level, that they are a sociopath. When you feel that through the kick of the Holy Spirit, you got to stop and realize in this moment, man, I need to steer clear of them because if I don't, it will be on record that I was in support of that individual. It's a very DC passage, isn't it? The malicious man. It begs the question, are you regularly connecting with people who strategize wickedness? Are you regularly connecting with people who strategize wickedness? Because this is a DC room and I know how we work, sometimes it's the people you have lunch with, the people you meet with, but sometimes it's the articles that you're reading. The malicious individuals that you've connected with, the John Adabs in your life, are people that have absolutely no connection to your life whatsoever. It's the stuff you read. It's the podcasts you listen to. It's the ones that you follow on Twitter that you're inundated through the, uh, through the uh, algorithm, uh, the, uh, the thoughts and the attitudes and the ideas that run across their minds. Are you regularly connecting with people who strategize wickedness? If it's anything apart from Almighty God, when we saturate our minds with it, it points us toward the evil one. And now let's flip over. 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 6 through 9, and we'll close. Here's what it says next. It says, so Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. And when the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and to make some special bread in my sight so that I may eat from her hand. Now stop right there for just a minute. Who is the king? The king is David. Amnon is his son. David is actually about to be complicit in this plan without even knowing it. So it says, verse 7, so David sent word to Tamar at the palace, go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon, who was lying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made it into bread in his sight and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him the bread, but he refused to eat it. Send everyone out of here, Amnon said. So everyone left him. We're going to leave the story right here for today. But I want to read what Amnon has just done. He's been infatuated and obsessed with her instead of renewing his mind and praying through the issue. He then finds an unworthy, encouraging accomplice, a Jonadab instead of a Jonathan. And all of a sudden, that encouraging voice's words start to ring in his ears to where it makes its way from not just being in his mind, but it has infected his heart and is a part of his entire being at this point. He can no longer hear the voice of the Lord in his life. And now we have the date on the calendar that he has set up and put himself in position to act. If you're taking notes, how does a Christian end up crossing a clear biblical boundary? Number one, we become obsessed and infatuated with wickedness. Number two, we find an encouraging accomplice. And number three, we put ourselves in position to act. I love to stop the story right here. Because at this point, Amnon doesn't have to do it. He doesn't have to follow through with the sin. And for some of you in this room, it could be that you've come in today and you are fully saturated with sin in your mind, in your heart. You are fully saturated with the words from a, an ungodly other that is speaking into your life. But you may be the one who has the date circled on the calendar for wickedness, but you've not done it yet. But you've not followed through with this wickedness that you plotted. And maybe, just maybe, today is the flashing red light of the Holy Spirit to let you know, don't stink and do it. Don't follow through with it. You will be a different person after this. Now, praise God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. If you've made your mistake, you can be redeemed. Hallelujah. But let's not walk through those doors if we don't have to. Let's not put that weight on our lives. And you watch it. What's going to take place in 2 Samuel 13 has reverberations for generations through the house of David. It ends up ripping it to shreds. 
If you're taking notes, a little quote here for you. Last quote today. Unhealthy obsessions encouraged by ungodly confidants are just a strategic moment away from becoming a reality. Unhealthy obsessions encouraged by ungodly confidants are just a strategic moment away from becoming a reality. I'm not a violent person. I played violent sports. I played football, played baseball, and then when I was in college, I played a little bit of lacrosse. Not a violent person by nature. In fact, I've only been in one fight. Some of you have heard that story before, and it wasn't even a good fight. All right? I'm not a fighter. But something happened. I was playing lacrosse at Oklahoma State University, and um, I dated a girl for three and a half years when we were in college, and uh, we were engaged, broke off the engagement, both of us very deeply hurt, and we both worked at the finest restaurant in America, Red Lobster, all right? I worked there for four and a half years, got her a job as a host, and one day after we'd broken up, she came to the restaurant on one of my shifts, and she came with one of the, one of the guys on the lacrosse team, so one of my teammates. I played midfielder. He played defenseman. And so if you know anything about lacrosse, he was six foot two, big guy. And then I'm five foot nine. And back in those days, I was about 175 pounds. I was not, not big. So I start to obsess over it. I asked to leave that shift. I couldn't stay. I left. And then all of a sudden, it just stirred in this infatuation and obsession. And not like you would think. I wanted to hurt him. I wanted to hurt this guy. And I was just so viciously angry infatuation and obsession. All of a sudden, I've got a friend who was a John Adab and not a Jonathan in the circumstance. And he goes, dude, I'll tell you what you should do. First practice of the season in lacrosse, he goes, you should decleat him. Now, if you know anything about lacrosse, the rules of lacrosse are you can hit someone as hard as you want as long as your fists are together. As long as you're holding onto the stick, your fists are together. And there's a principle in the scientific method called leverage, all right? You can get leverage, and even though I'm 5'9 and he's 6'2", when he cuts across the middle, I could pop him up like this and declete him onto his back. In the game, you're kind of prepared for it. In practice, nobody hits that hard in practice because you're teammates. But that idea has been planted by an encouraging accomplice in my head. So, very first practice of the season... We get to playing, we're doing a drill where he's coming across the middle, and here's this moment. And all I could think of the entire practice was decleating him to help him feel bad the way that he had made me feel bad. He cuts across the middle, and when he does, with all my might, I punch up like this, hit him off his balance, he lands on his back, and when he does, the air comes out of him because he wasn't expecting it at all, and he's laying on his back and rolling around. Well, all of a sudden, Jim Hedrick, our coach, he coached at the Naval Academy before, it was a, played lacrosse at the Naval Academy before he came to our school. He runs up, grabs me by the face mask, and Jim Hedrick goes, Zach, what are you doing? He's your teammate. What are you doing? He's your teammate. And another guy who played attackman for us from Chicago, he runs up, and I watch him whisper in Coach Hedrick's ear while he has me by the face mask. And whatever he says to him, Coach Hedrick lets go and goes, oh, that makes sense. Good job, Zach. Carry on. Carry on. True moment. Can I tell you what happened for me? I couldn't believe it. Not what Coach Hedrick had said. I believe that, all right? I couldn't believe that I had hit another man, that I had been violent to someone. It wasn't a game. I hated him. And all of a sudden, I began to cry. I quit the team that day. That was the last lacrosse practice I ever went to, the last play I ever ran in collegiate athletics. Now, I'm not telling you to quit today. But I'm telling you this. I didn't want to be that man anymore and I did not want to put myself in a circumstance where I would do something like that to another person again. Now listen to me. For some of you, you've saturated your mind. You've had people affirm you that your hate is justified, that your anger, that your affair, that your wickedness is justified. And you were right on the cusp with the date circled on the calendar to follow through with the unthinkable. And you've forgotten exactly what it is you'll trade if you do that. Please. I want to encourage you. 
heed the warning sign today. And maybe you take the long way to work. Maybe you go eat lunch by yourself. Maybe you let them know that you are pulling away from that appointment and you are just not going to show up. You'd say, but Zach, what are they going to think? Later on down the line, you know what they're going to think? They're going to think you got free. That's what they're going to think. I want to encourage you. Get away. If you don't, it's not just Amnon. You follow the path of Judas. Last little passage. Flip over to Luke 22. And let's read verses 1 through 7. And you're going to watch this. The same path of Cain, the same path of Tamar, or excuse me, the same path of Amnon. In Luke chapter 22, we get to see that the same thing happens to Judas when he betrays the Son of God into the hands of men. Look at Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 1. It says, Now the feast of unleavened bread, called the Passover, was approaching. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. It says, Then Satan entered Judas Iscariot, called one of the twelve. You picture there again, he's been saturated with this wickedness. He's been infatuated with all of this. It fills his head. It enters him. Look at verse 4. Then Judas went to the chief priest. He finds these encouraging accomplices and officers in the temple guard and discuss with them, look at this, how he might betray Jesus. Underline and highlight how he might betray Jesus. At this point, it's still in theory. It's still out there. But he walks with them and says, you know, guys, I've had these thoughts. Have you had some that are the same? And the encouraging accomplices come along and go, "Woo! he loses a whole lot more in this than we do, kids. We've been trying to think of a way. Which one of us had to politically fall on the sword in order to capture Jesus? Hey, we got a guy on the inside. He doesn't mind throwing his life away. And that's exactly who the enemy goes after. It says, verse 5, they were delighted. And they agreed to give him money. Hey, whatever it takes, dude. He consented and he watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. I've always thought it interesting that verse 7 comes on the heels of verses 1 through 6. <laughs> came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Judas in this circumstance did not have to be the one who did this. I think it's why Jesus is so clear with him about the plan. We become infatuated with wickedness. We find that encouraging accomplice, and then we circle the date on the calendar on which we need to act. It begs the question, does your schedule encourage sin or righteousness? Does your schedule encourage sin or righteousness? For some of you, there are some dates that you need to pull out the eraser and be wicked. If being around that man or woman stirs desire in you that is ungodly, then erase the date on the calendar. If being around that level of commerce causes you to want to dig into crippling debt, erase the date on the calendar. If driving past a place makes you desire a substance so deeply that you hurt on the inside, just like Amnon, take the long way to work and then see the extra gas that you're paying for, which is no small sacrifice at this point, as a sacrifice of rejoicing to Almighty God. Wouldn't it be better, Jesus said, for you to lose your hand, for you to lose your eye, than to have your entire body thrown into hell? We've got to come to a point where we heed the warning. One last thing and we'll close. You know what's so interesting about these principles? If you go one way with them, it leads to ultimate wickedness. But if you go the other way, these are the same principles in how we are a part of supreme righteousness. We become obsessed and infatuated with God's word and our relationship with him. When we saturate our hearts and minds with him, it pushes us to the next level. We find a godly accomplice to come alongside with us, to put again encouraging words, rejoicing words, thanksgiving words in our ears, no, noble, true, righteous words in our ears. And then what happens? We put ourselves in position to act. 
to do those godly things that our faith is producing. When we do that, the devil knows if I can get you started on the wrong path, all it takes is a few extra moves and then you end up doing the unthinkable. On the opposite side, the Spirit is pleading with us, follow me, infatuate, be infatuated with my word. Men, study me, saturate yourself in the things of Almighty God, and then I'll bring godly people around you and lead you towards great and mighty things. But you got to choose. Does your schedule encourage sin or does it encourage righteousness? Thanks for listening today. If this is your warning sign, I want to encourage you to heed it. Next week is the darkness. Amnon does not heed it. Next week is the darkness and it's a different message. But for this week, maybe the Lord is calling out to you through the power of his spirit and through a dude with a weird red dot on his lip, all right? Maybe the Lord is calling out to you today to calm down. Let's bow our heads for prayer.